Welcome everybody to the latest episode of the Green Left Show. Today we're going to be talking about trans rights. My name's Alex Bainbridge. Before we get started, I do want to acknowledge that we are filming this show on stolen Aboriginal land. Sovereignty was never ceded and we pay our respects to Elders past and present. Uh, always was, always will be Aboriginal land. Also at the outset I just want to say that if you like the work that we do, please become a Green Left supporter if you're not already. It is the number one way you can help support the work that we do. Um, it is the best way to get the content that we that we produce as well as you know, a bit of financial support for Green FT. It makes all the difference. Uh, plans start from just $5 a month and it's, as I said, the number one, number one way you can, you can support our work. Today we're going to be talking about trans rights and I'm joined by two guests. Charlie Murphy, who is a trans activist in Sydney and a member of Pride and Protest as well as other groups. And also Nova Sabrelski, who is a trans activist in WA um, and a member of the Socialist Alliance. The overturning of Roe versus Wade in the United States by the Supreme Court has been a dramatic um, development, uh, perhaps not surprising, but nevertheless still is very shocking. And what it does show is that uh, rights that have been long taken for granted uh, can, be, um, can be overturned and upended by, by an insurgent right wing. One of the, the main campaigns that the right wing has been um, waging in recent years in order to gain ground is their attack on trans rights. Uh, we've, this is an international phenomenon. We've seen it particularly violently in the United States, uh, but also in Australia as well. In the in the recent federal election, um, with the with the LNP endorsing Catherine Deves and uh, and Liberal leadership going out of out of their way to um, to to in, to, you know, to endorse um, her particular brand of transphobia. And so I began by asking Charlie, can you please tell us why is it you think the right wing is attacking attacking trans rights in this way, and what does it mean? Yeah, I think I think you know that the right, the current right wing attacks against um, trans people are one of the oldest, um, you know, tricks in the playbook of the right, um, which is to divide and conquer. You know, trans people are members of the working class. Um, it's no surprise that actually a lot of the attacks are focused on um, rights in schools. Um, because trans people often, um, if they are in employment at all, um, are in employment which is in feminised labour, um, and that includes um, teachers and educators. Um, it is a deliberate attack to say that we as working class people are separate from each other, we're different, we're people to be afraid of. Um, and I think that, that is, that's pretty clear in what has happened both in the US and in Australia. In Australia, we had, you know, the debate around the Religious Freedoms Bill and what that essentially was about was giving more power um, to the bosses to hire and fire, um, to, to, to not hire or, or to fire um, queer and trans workers. Um, and that's very much the same thing that's happening in the US as well. Um, we saw that in Florida there was the Don't Say Gay Bill. Again, it was attacks on schools um, and there uh, have been a lot of attacks in general on queer educators um, in the US as well. Um, so it's obvious why they're making those attacks. Um, it's because they don't want workers' power. They don't want workers' power for trans people. They don't want workers' power for anyone. Um, but how do you strip away workers' rights um, and don't frame it in that way. Well, you say that you're um, protecting children at school, so that's why we need um, more power for religious bosses, you know. Um, we're protecting against the groomers in the US. That's why we're going to have charter schools. Um, it's, it, it's all about taking power away from the hands of, of working class people, um, which trans people are overwhelmingly, um, and concentrating it in, in the power, power of bosses. Uh, these interviews were conducted separately and I asked Nova the same question and she had similar points to make. Okay, so the pivot that the right wing took towards attacking trans rights really happened in Australia immediately after the gay marriage plebiscite once that was officially, once we officially won the right to marry. Um, and I mean... I don't want to be too boring in my analysis, but it really is that the right wing in wanting to increase uh, increase tax cuts and have a very uh, elite, uh, have, have a politics for their elite party funding 
people. Um, they can't just outright put that forth to the Australian people. So they have to find somebody to attack. And this year in 2022 election cycle, they tried really hard to make it us trans people that would become the uh, political scapegoat of the right wing. I'm wondering, Nova, if you can tell us more about specifically the issue about trans women in sports. This seems to be one of the issues which is being particularly targeted. Can you tell us what are some of the arguments the right wing are making and what is wrong with them? So FEMA and a number of other elite sports organisations have uh, implemented bans on uh, trans women competing at all. Um, in particular, FINA, which is the international governing body for elite swimming, and uh, International Rugby League, I believe. Um, you've also had FIFA say that they're going to reconsider what they're going to do within the year, and uh, and a number of other elite sporting organisations. Um, FINA in particular has not been open in how they, in the information they've released regarding the ban or why it's been implemented. But what they've looked at, what they have released, they seem to be comparing the athletic performance of cis men to, um, to cis women, um, which is obviously a non starter. It's not an accurate and fair representation of the debate. Um, the human rights regulations, uh, international law human rights regulations on uh, how sporting codes have to deal with the inclusion of trans people is that they have to start from a position of inclusion unless there is sufficient means, uh, unless there is sufficient risk of uh, harm that it cannot be mitigated through other means, uh, allowing trans women to compete. A lot of the arguments that are made start with the premise of, with the illeg illegitimacy of the, uh, the illegitimacy of transgender people's gender identity. Um, transgender people are within the natural diversity of women's bodies. Um, uh, and so are intersex people who are also, we can't forget, significantly impacted by this whole uh, issue. So, um, so from starting from this position of you are something different and you need to prove yourself in order to be included um, puts the whole debate on its head. Um, when it comes to the science surrounding uh, possible benefits of uh, possible advantages that trans women have over cis women in sports, um, it's an incredibly complicated area of science that is entirely underfunded. There is very little research that has happened, particularly, may I add, in elite swimming. So each different sporting code, uh, each different type of sport, has to have its own individual, uh, individual research into what constitutes a benefit and to what extent that benefit will remain among trans women who have experienced male puberty. Um, as it's using the language of um, the bands that Fina put out. Most experts, uh, endocrinologists, don't think sufficient research has been done in that area to justify a ban. Um, Fina might have some research, they haven't revealed to the world for scrutiny, um, but without releasing that, we can't say. Also, the, the snowball effect that the Fina ban has had with so many different codes going on to be like, okay, well, we're going to ban them too. We're going to ban them too. We're going to ban them too. Um, it, it shows that this has been elevated not by the scientific inquiry, but by the vitriol and hatred that uh, the UK media and the United States media in particular have had towards trans people um, really uh, focusing on trans women competing in sports um, as, a, as a scapegoat. And we'll turn to Charlie now. Um, can you please talk to us about some of the transition leave campaigns, especially in the university sector? 
Yeah, I mean, this is kind of the flip side of of the attacks. Is that how do you solve the problem of um, of the ruling class dividing us as working class people um, using transphobia, racism, sexism, all those kinds of things? Um, well, you actually declare unequivocally that we all as workers um, deserve deserve our rights, and different workers have different requirements. Um, for the positions that they're in. That's why we have um, paid parental leave. That's why we should be instituting things like menstrual leave. And transition leave is very much the same. As I said, trans people so often um, are not even people that are in employment, um, let alone stable employment. Um, and one of the reasons why that is is because when people go through transition, it is uh, something that upends your life um, because of the way that our society is structured is not to be friendly um, to people who transition. Um, relationships can be lost, jobs can be lost, all those kinds of things make it really difficult to stay in work. Um, but something that would allow people to stay in jobs um, if they are trans and that they're transitioning, um, is to have the ability to actually take the time off that they need um, to transition. And this can be transitioning in different ways. It could be a medical procedure, um, but it also could be uh, taking time off for, you know, social reasons or, or, or for legal changes, all those kinds of things, um, to actually take that time off um, and take that time off to be paid as well, um, like we would um, for anyone that we provide any form of of special leave for their situation for. Um, and that actually will allow trans people um, to stay in a job that they might have, um, which so often, most of the time, when people transition, they just can't do. When I transitioned, I, I quit my job um, that I had, and it's an incredibly common story. Um, so in terms of transition leave, there is a campaign that's going on at the moment um, coming from the NTEU, um, which is the uh, Tertiary Educators Union, um, specifically in the University of Sydney, um, which I've been on the picket line for um, supporting those educators there. Um, they've made the demand of six weeks of transition lead paid every year if the worker wants to take it. Um, now, I know that a number of other universities are taking up this claim in their EBA, um, and this is the kind of thing that we actually need to see in terms of what we're putting forward for workers' rights um, across every industry and every sector. Um, because not only does it say, you know, along with pay rises, ending casualisation, um, all the things that every single worker deserves and needs in their job, um, we actually say alongside that there is no worker left behind. You know, we are not going to leave... Um, parents and women um, behind um, by not giving them the leave that we need. We're not going to leave trans people behind by not giving them the leave that they need. We're not going to leave Aboriginal people behind um, by not having targets, um, employment targets for, for First Nations people. Um, when we stick together and we say that we all deserve you know, our wages at work, we all deserve higher wages. Um, but not only that, um, but every single worker in the condition that they're in and the position that they are in, especially if they belong to an oppressed group of people that that experience a specific type of oppression, um, that they deserve their material rights. And that's what that campaign is about. And it would be amazing to see this kind of seed from the NTU um, grow into a mighty oak across the workers' movement. So one of the main vehicles that the political right in Australia have used to target trans rights, and I guess to, to cut back against the whole LGBTIQ community after the marriage equality victory, has been the LNP's Religious Discrimination Bill, um, Religious Bigotry Bill. Now, the ALP voted for that bill, even though there were some amendments made to it, and they've also promised that they're going to bring in a, a version of that bill in this term of parliament. Charlie, can you please, please perhaps tell us your thoughts about this and what was your message to the ALP? Yes, my message to Anthony Albanese on this uh, is the same message that we said time and time again, kill the bill. There is no reason for this bill to exist in parliament. It was specifically introduced by the Liberal Party as a form of backlash against the passing of marriage equality. It was designed in its outset to benefit those religious institutions 
that have huge material power and sway over thousands of workers that they employ in schooling, in aged care, and in another of uh, other sectors for them to have more power as bosses. There's no reason for this bill to be reintroduced into the parliament. Labor got wedged by Liberals on it. They do not need to do it anymore. They can abandon it. There's no reason to do it. Time and time again, we say kill the bill. We don't want to see it revived. If it is revived, we will be just as fierce in fighting the Labor government against this bill as we were against the Liberals. And, and Nova, what would your message be to the ALP on this? When it comes to the Labor Party and the bill they get to propose, we don't know what the details of that are going to look like. Um, but we don't. I don't really see what a bill like this could achieve other than granting the right to discriminate. Um, religious uh, religion is already a fairly well protected class in existing discrimination law on the state and federal level um, across Australia. Um, there are differences between uh, who trumps in terms of uh, queer rights to non-discrimination versus religious organisations being able to discriminate on the grounds of their religion, um, where you have very progressive for queer legislation in places like, uh, I think it's Victoria, could be wrong on that. Um, and you have the, most of Australia who do have exemptions in anti-discrimination law for religious organisations already to discriminate. There, there are arguments to be made that this would, this could be a shield for uh, minority religions, uh, Muslim people in particular in Australia, to use uh, to protect themselves from discrimination, including from other religious groups. Um, but it seems that the reason that the Labor Party introduced this legislation in the first place was to try and win back votes from the centrist uh, Catholic people, uh, from the, from the centre-right Catholic demographic, where they formerly, if they previously had votes um, and felt like they had lost them during the gay marriage debate. There's one brand of attack on trans rights, which comes in the, the form of you know, a radical feminism, or what's often called um, TERFism, uh, trans exclusionary radical feminism. Perhaps, Charlie, can you please explain to us why cis women or cis women feminists have got a stake in supporting trans rights? Um, the reason why cis women should reject these arguments um, is because what the basis of our feminist understanding of why women are oppressed in, in society um, comes down to the way that we are divided into what, in, into what labour um, we perform um, and other ways of then disciplining that class of workers. Um, and trans women and cis women are disciplined in the same way. They belong together in that same oppression, albeit in different ways. You know, cis women and trans women, we are all in different forms of feminised labour. We are overwhelmingly teachers and educators. We are sex workers. We do the work of women in society and we are oppressed um, in similar ways because of that. Um, now, we're not going to win rights for all women as workers if um, if cis women are taking on these turf arguments and saying that we need to be separated in these arbitrary ways when we know that the way that we experience our oppression um, is, is, is the same. Um, and we're not going to win women's rights by, you know, having, having these bigots, right-wing bigots, um, be pushing things like, you know, not having inclusion in sports or more power for religious bosses, um, while at the same time they're doing stuff like trying to criminalise abortion. You know, that is not someone who stands for any women's rights. Um, and these are the people that the TERFs are going to cheer on um, when push comes to shove in terms of their agenda. They're the only people 
if in power, will actually institute what they want to see. And that's why all forms of feminists should um, explicitly reject turfism as a right-wing ideology. And Nova, your thoughts, why should, why should cis women feminists reject turf arguments? When you police trans bodies, you inevitably have to police everyone's bodies because you need to find out which ones are trans. Um, and a, a lot of turf will like say, we can always tell. And like, I, I don't care to pass. I know people can tell I'm trans when I'm walking down the street. I like that. Um, but it, it's obviously not true. Women's bodies are diverse. Um, there have been multiple instances of women having their bodies policed by turfs when they've gone to the bathroom, um, completely cis women, and uh, be, being called being called trans and be, having the slurs that are thrown at us every day in front of them. In particular, regarding sport, the, the way that people want to enforce women's bodies in sport, in the state, some of the legislation around trans people's participation in sport uh, allows for gen genital examinations of participants if somebody has brought their gender into question. Any gender non-conforming person, uh, anyone who doesn't hold the traditional uh, looks of uh, that are considered feminine by society, can have the it can have we will have these invasive procedures performed on them. World Pride will be happening in Sydney in February next year. Charlie, I'm wondering if you can perhaps tell us some of the things that the trans community will be taking to World Pride and or some of the other campaigns that you think that, are, that, that you know, we should be waging to, to advance the cause of trans liberation. Yeah, look, for World Pride in New South Wales, um, we have had one of the independent uh, MPs of New South Wales. Um, he's essentially a teal, um, you know, a teal before they were grouped as teals in the federal election. His name is Alex Brenich, and he's proposed a um, so-called equality bill um, where there are a number of changes that he wants to see um, to the law. You know, some of those things include, you know, birth certificate reform, um, you know, changes, legal changes for trans people, which are definitely supportable. But what we want to say um, is what we've been saying throughout all of this conversation, that trans rights are workers' rights, um, we want to see a big showing of support for transition leave, you know, support for the right to transition in both um, recognition and our, and, and our material everyday lives, our material realities. Um, you know, World Pride is also going to be a big international event. We want to see, you know, a really strong internationalist workers' movement, um, you know, be loud and proud and say that, you know, we are made up of, trans people, we are made up of LGBT people, uh, we are made up of cis and straight people, all saying together that no trans person is left behind, there is no right to discriminate, and that trans rights are workers' rights. And, and, and finally, Nova, can you please talk to us about the issue of uh, trans women in prisons and what the trans community is doing about that? Yeah, so one of the major issues that's happening in the trans community is uh, that when we are thrown in jail, um, because obviously everyone will eventually, if within any demographic, there will be a certain population in jails. Um, there isn't consistent legislation across Australia in terms of uh, which jails trans women should be sent to. Um, when trans women are sent to the wrong gendered jails, to men, when trans women are sent to men's jails, um, we face far higher rates of violence and are often put into uh, solidary confinement uh, with the justification of it's for our own safety. And that may even be true, um, but it's still a horrible place to be a, a cruel and unusual punishment. Um, I do believe that using solitary confinement as a means to ensure someone's safety, uh, it would have to violate human rights law, surely. Um, and, and this is commonplace within the Australian prison system. Um, 
there is currently no legislation one way or the other about how the courts, uh, about which jails trans women ought to be sent to in WA. Um, so it's decided entirely on a case by case basis. Um, and sometimes it goes well and sometimes it goes poorly. Um, and it's, it's one of the many issues that is completely off the radar of the media in terms of a trans rights issue, a trans rights debate. Like, this is trans rights. This is costing lives. Well, thanks for that, Nova. That certainly is a sobering point to finish on. Um, it truly is the case that this is an important issue. In fact, as it says on my T-shirt, you probably can't see, but queer pride saves lives. Lives are at stake, and that's why we will always be supporting trans rights here at Green Left. Uh, but that brings our show to an end today. I'd like to make a special thanks to Nova and Charlie both for joining us and being our guests. I'd like to make a special thank you to you for, for tuning in. As I said at the beginning, if you do like our work, please do become a Green Left supporter. It is the best way you can support our work. You can also uh, make a financial contribution on Patreon. And also, as without paying a single cent, you can support our work simply by sharing this video uh, or the podcast, uh, telling your friends about it, help us to build the audience, share the other work that Green Left um, produces. And until we see you next time, goodbye.